Welcome to Sutherland, South Africa. This is the site of the South African Astronomical Observatory and it's the premier site for optical astronomy in the country. The observatory was established 40 years ago and is it in a, a position which is uh, excellent climate for astronomy with many clear hours per year and also uh, in a very, very dark site. Uh, it is also the site of the Southern African Large Telescope, a multinational project which uh, was completed in 2005 and science operations began in 2011. So SALT is located with uh, about 20 other telescopes on this small hill uh, in the Karoo. It's about an altitude of 1800 meters uh, and it's in a region which is very underpopulated with no uh, major uh, towns or cities anywhere nearby, which means there's no light pollution here. So the skies that we have in Sutherland are some of the darkest that you'll find anywhere on Earth. Uh, and that's obviously one of the main reasons for locating the observatory here near Sutherland. The other reason is that it's in a region between the two main weather systems that affect South Africa. The summer rainfall uh, comes up in the northeast of the country and the winter rains come with uh, cold fronts through the Cape and Sutherland straddles that and often misses the weather associated with that which means we have a lot of uh, clear uh, nights uh, in a year to be able to do astronomy. From about uh, early afternoon we begin to air condition the inside of the dome uh, so that by the time we open up at the beginning of the night the temperature inside is pretty close to that of the outside temperature. This is to avoid, uh, to avoid air currents which can cause distortion of the images and make them blurrier than they would be otherwise. Uh, and these louvers that open up uh, during the evening uh, also keep the building ventilated to ensure that the temperature inside and outside are in equilibrium. So this is the uh, telescope and uh, what you can see here is the heart of it which is the primary mirror array. It consists of 91 individual mirror segments, hexagonal in shape, and they're roughly 1.2 meters in size. They're all in a, uh, a spherical configuration and they're aligned to behave as if they're one single, uh, effectively 10 meter uh, diameter mirror. These mirror segments have been taken out of the telescope for cleaning and recoating a process that we uh, do throughout the year, typically uh, twice a week, so that we keep the reflective coating uh, in the telescope um, at maximum efficiency. So the interesting aspects of this telescope is that it's designed such that the uh, altitude direction, the up and down direction of the telescope is fixed, which is uh, something which keeps the cost of the telescope and the complexity of the engineering uh, much simpler. The cost of this telescope is typically at about a fifth of the cost of a conventional telescope which would have the varying altitude as well as azimuth and having to factor in the, uh, the changing gravity which causes uh, different forces on the telescope. So the fact that it's uh, a fifth of the cost um, but still able to basically observe 70% of the southern sky uh, made it a, a compelling design for South Africa to, to keep the costs down and yet still have the capability of a large 10 meter class telescope. Uh, this design was pioneered by a telescope in the United States called the Hobby Eberly Telescope and then uh, it was the, the basis of the design for SALT. So, the way in which this telescope operates is that it can move in azimuth, which is rotating left-right, uh, to anywhere 
uh, and uh, then acquiring the, the target to observe. Uh, and so to track the object as it moves across the sky due to the Earth's rotation, there's a tracker right at the top there near the focus of the telescope called the prime focus. Uh, and that is what's used to track the object as it moves from east to west. We can see here the prime focus payload mounted on the tracker. So all of the instrumentation, all of the optics, uh, guide cameras, calibration systems are all inside this unit. Uh, it weighs about two tons and it has to move very accurately uh, to follow an object during an observation. So it's mounted on this tracker beam uh, and it can move up and down the tracker beam in the Y direction and the whole tracker itself moves left and right in the X direction. In addition, it has to move up and down to keep the object in focus and also rotate to counter the rotation on the sky as the object is, uh, is being tracked. You can also see here these triangular legs which are hexapods which are extendable legs that can tip and tilt the payload so that the optical axis of the whole system is always on a radius vector of the primary mirror. At the top here you can see the main workhorse science instrument for the telescope which is the Robert Stovey spectrograph. It consists of a variety of different gratings to do uh, different dispersion spectroscopy. It has a set of filters um, and all of these can be interchanged automatically in the control room by the astronomer to configure the instrument for observations um, from, uh, for different programs. These are two FabriPro uh, etalons of the same sort that are used in the Robert Stobey spectrograph on Sol. These two etalons here are actually designed for a different, smaller telescope so they're smaller in size in each dimension by about a factor of two. So you can imagine that the etalons on the SALT telescope are much bigger, much more massive, really spectacular pieces of optical engineering. There are two different spectral resolutions. The first of these etalons has a resolution, a so-called high resolution etalon with resolution of about 10,000. It's used for absorption and emission line work primarily in stars and star clusters. The other etalon has lower spectral resolution, around 2,000, appropriate for the work that we do in measuring the motions within galaxies. These etalons are on a light box, and what we're seeing when we look into it are the emission lines from the fluorescent lamps below, and that's what produces the colored rings. When they're in use on the telescope, these electrical connectors over here are connected to a controller that stabilizes the etalons in both tip and tilt and spacing. And it can control all of those motions to about 10 atomic diameters. These are really spectacular pieces of engineering and electronics. Also in here is the uh, acquisition camera uh, and the uh, high-speed imaging camera, Solticam. There's also a fiber feed uh, where the light can be sent down optical fibers uh, down to a very stable spectrograph in the uh, uh, spectrometer room below the telescope. There are a total of 16 optical fibers that uh, droop down through below the primary mirror and down into the spectrometer room about 40 meters, uh, 45 meters in length. So we're now in the spectrometer room which is underneath the telescope uh, and it's uh, a circular room inside the actual pier of the telescope on which it rests. And inside this room we have this black uh, rectangular structure or enclosure uh, which has the high resolution spectrograph inside it. The way it works is that light is focused into optical fibers at the top of the telescope and end up coming out through this circular hole in the ceiling, which is in fact the uh, center of the rotation bearing of the telescope about which it rotates. And this black cable that you can see coming down uh, has 
all of the uh, optical fibers uh, that take the light from the telescope and into the spectrograph. So this is where the electronic controls uh, and various other things like the uh, uh, detector cooling system, uh, the vacuum pump for the spectrograph are situated. Uh, the spectrograph itself is inside uh, this door which is uh, inside the main room. Uh, but because we want to keep this uh, very stable in temperature and constant, then we don't allow people to walk in and out of the the spectrograph room. There's no need to, in fact, because the whole instrument is inside a tank, completely sealed, and then covered in this sort of uh, polystyrene insulation material, which uh, is covered all, array, all the way around the vacuum tank to keep the uh, temperature at a very constant level. So in the control room is where the operator and the astronomer run the telescope during the night. So the operator is in charge of pointing the telescope to the uh, respective targets. The astronomer uh, chooses which targets to observe from the list of different programs which have been accepted um, for the telescope. So in front of them they have the uh, ability to choose the instrument configurations, uh, choose the targets, conduct the observations, and also to uh, analyze uh, the, the data and see uh, the initial um, reductions of the data. In addition, they're able to monitor the outside con conditions. They have a set of weather um, instrumentation uh, which can tell uh, the astronomer what the conditions are like, and that will determine really what the um, the sort of programs that they will undertake in a given night. <laughs>